Do you think there'll be attempts on Lucy Letby's life in prison? I think that there are prisoners uh, in the women's estate who will think nothing of trying to get a trophy uh, like Lucy Letby. My name's Vanessa Frake. I served 27 years in the prison service, the last 11 as governor at Wormwood Scrubs. Today, I'm going to be answering anonymous questions from the Lad Bible public. Where do prisoners get drugs and phones from? If only I knew the answer to that. From many, many different sources. Contraband like phones and drugs come into prison in all different shapes and sizes. You know, I've had dead pigeons fall at my feet, flat on their back, sewn up the middle, stuffed with drugs. Our drug dogs have found tennis balls that have been thrown over the walls, stuffed with drugs. They come in from the courts, they come in from bogus solicitors, they come in from staff. The problem with drugs in prison is that it is never ending. As soon as you shut one door, you can bet your bottom dollar that another one will open. Should we bring back the death penalty? Ooh, that's a difficult one, isn't it? If you'd have asked me this 20 years ago, without doubt, I'd have said absolutely yes and I'd have probably been the first to volunteer to do the death watch. Maybe I've gone a bit soft in my old age, but I'm not so sure that that is the right way to go these days. Yes, there are some horrendous evil crimes um, that happen these days, but is it really, as a society, do we want to take that step backwards? I'm not so sure that we do. There have been a lot of miscarriages of justice over the last couple of years, and I don't know how we as a society would live with ourselves if we executed the wrong person. What will prison be like for Lucy Letby? She will probably spend the majority of her time initially um, by herself in a segregation unit. She won't be allowed to mix with um, the general population of the prison at this precise time for obvious reasons, to protect not only her, but other prisoners. So for her, I'm afraid it's going to be quite a lonely existence. At some stage though, the prison authorities will risk assess and make that decision to try and uh, integrate her into the general population. But I shouldn't think that that will, won't be for a, a good few years yet. You know, child killers in this day and age are seen as the lowest of the low in prison. The likes of Lucy Letby will probably always have to look over her shoulder. You know, prison staff can be there most of the time, but there will always be that occasion when they won't be about. Do you think there'll be attempts on Lucy Letby's life in prison? I think that there are prisoners uh, in the women's estate who will think nothing of trying to get a trophy uh, like Lucy Letby. Um, you know, there are, there are some serious um, prisoners locked up in the female estate who would, would, would have a go in the blink of an eye if given the opportunity. What makes somebody evil? I don't think that you're necessarily born evil. I don't think that you're necessarily um, turn evil overnight. I think it's, it's a very um, difficult question. Everybody has the, the ability to be evil. It's just whether we decide to act on that or not. Without a doubt, I've come across evil prisoners. Without a doubt. Myra Hindley, Rose West, Beverly Allett. You know, all these people um, can be described as evil. You know, they're, they're serial killers. How can you say that somebody like that isn't evil? Beverly Allett, also known as the Angel of Death, she um, was responsible, I think it was for four or five deaths of babies and about, I think it was another nine or so attempted murders. Um, she was brought into um, Holloway Prison. Um, she went to the uh, psychiatric unit um, and was later transferred out of um, Holloway to Broadmoor, which is where she sits today. Rose West. Um, a typical psychopath, I'd say, very uh, willing to do whatever she's told to do. Um, but all the time you're th looking at her and thinking, yes, you're quite cunning. I mean, I had Rose West on my wing in uh, before she went to Winchester Crown for her trial. 
Um, I was actually, myself and the governor, the person that informed her that Fred West had uh, killed himself. Now, Rose West didn't bat an eyelid when the governor came onto the wing. He came and he said to me, I need to speak to Rose West. Um, I unlocked her, stood there next to him, and he told her that uh, Fred had killed himself that lunchtime. It was New Year's Day. And uh, this was around tea time. Rose West didn't blink. She didn't flinch. She didn't cry. She didn't shout out nothing. There was no emotion, no reaction. Um, I do believe that Rose thought that Fred, now he had died, would um, all everything that she was charged with would go away. Obviously, that wasn't the case. She's one of the few um, all life, uh, whole life sentence um, female prisoners. Um, so Rose was was easy to manage. She was no problem. She did what she was told. Um, you know, she had thick bottleneck glasses. She was constantly knitting, although we continually never really knew what she was knitting. It just seemed that she was knitting on and on and on without sort of really a pattern or, or shape taking place. Myra Hindley, I've only met Myra Hindley just once, um, and that was at uh, Cook and Wood, um, which was a, um, a prison down in Kent. And Holloway used to transfer convicted women down to Cook and Wood um, on a regular basis, basically to free up space at Holloway. And um, one day I was, um, I was the most junior member of staff. There were two other staff and I think we took four prisoners from Holloway down to uh, Cook and Wood. And when we got to the receptions unit, there was um, like this big fat, um, huge officer. I don't think I've ever seen such, such a huge woman. Um, and her, her like shirt was, was so tight, she'd actually had to sew herself into it, which I always thought was a bit of a joke, really. But um, anyways, she screamed at the top of her voice, Myra! And I was like, oh, oh, clearly, clearly Myra's coming. Um, and uh, the officer said next to me, you know who, who's coming, don't you? And I went, I haven't got a clue. She went, that'll be Myra Hindley. She's the orderly. She works in receptions down here. I was like, oh, right, right, okay, fine, fair enough. Anyways, what I can only describe as a bag lady rocked up. She had a, like a, a long brown cardigan on that was threadbare at the elbows. Um, her hair was a mousy brown sort of with some sort of dreadful, almost like feather haircut. She sort of shuffled along. Her, her skirt was old and worn. She, you know, she, she, honestly, if you'd, have, if you'd have passed her in the street, you wouldn't have recognized her. Anyway, she came up to us, asked us all if we wanted a cup of tea. I said, yeah, two, two sugars, please. And off she trottled. Um, she came back, gave us our tea, drank it, it was fine. Somebody once said to me, you didn't actually drink it, did you? And I was like, well, yeah, I was thirsty. Who's the scariest person you've ever met and why? Mm. Um, I presume you mean prisoner. There were quite a few scary staff, I, I won't lie, uh, when I first joined the job. But uh, prisoner-wise, um, I'm not sure if I ever thought any prisoner was scary. I may have been wary of them. There is a difference. Um, I think if you ever thought that somebody was scary or you were scared, you couldn't have done the job. So I'm not sure I ever thought a prisoner was scary. I was at, um, up in Wakefield Prison, which was um, called Monster Mount, Man excuse me, was called Monster Mansion at one time because of the amount of sex offenders there. Um, and I was up there having a look around with a view to transferring up there. I hasten to add I didn't. But um, I did bump into Colin Ireland at one point um, whilst I was there. Um, he was quite a big bloke, about six foot six by six foot six wide. He was the gay killer in uh, Soho. He lured men back to his flat where he murdered them. Um, now, he was, he was probably the one that made me do a double take. Um, but as, as for scary as such, no, I don't think that there were particularly any prisoners that I found scary. If you went to prison tomorrow, how would you behave? 
that is a really easy question for me to answer. Having watched prisoners closely for nigh on 30 years, I would be politeness itself. I would be up to all sorts underneath, but to officers and prison staff, I'd be polite. I'd get myself a job, probably uh, the tea girl, uh, making cups of tea for, for officers because they're unlocked a lot. Um, I'd get to hear what officers talk about because they can't help but talking about themselves. I'd see who were good officers, who were bad officers, who were officers that I might want to corrupt a little bit. That's how I would behave in prison. Well, it's interesting how prisoners act because, you know, women um, act totally different to men. You know, they have a, a laugh and a joke with each other. They make friends quite easily. Um, they have sexual re relationships with each other um, where they might may be heterosexual on the outside. Um, men are totally different. They're quite um, reserved. They're quite, uh, they don't make friendships easily. And certainly, you know, there's no open homosexuality um, per se. <clears throat> oh, I'm not going to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> what was it, Abby? It was, it was, have you had any famous people in prison? I'm sick of answering that question because, you know, these people are absolute. We had Pete Doherty when I was at Scrubs. Can we, yeah, can we do that? <laughs> Pete Doherty, formerly of the Libertines um, and Baby Shambles, I think. I think he got about three months sentence for uh, either contempt of court or um, drugs charges, one of the two. We decided because he was um, on drugs that we would send him to our detox unit. It was a unit about 54, 55 uh, prisoners. So only a small unit, but all of them were detoxing from drugs or attempting to detox from drugs. So that's where he went. Um, and then sort of a couple of days later, we, we heard from the staff on, on the detox unit that they were going through cell cards quicker than, than anything because every, every cell has a cell card outside it. It has the prisoner's name, his number, who belongs in that cell. Um, and these cell, his Peak Dirty's uh, cell cards were disappearing at an alarming rate. Um, and he was basically autographing them and giving them out to prisoners on the wing. <laughs> um, and then I came into work one Sunday morning uh, to be greeted by, I think it was the News of the World. Um, and on the front page was Pete Doherty uh, smoking joints, being photographed with a mobile phone uh, on the detox unit with several prisoners. It did sort of grate on me a bit that we had tried to help him, put him in the best place possible that we could think of putting him um, <clears throat> in, in order to try and help him with his, uh, with his drug habit. Uh, and clearly, you know, he kind of threw that back in the prison's face. Which TV show films portray British prisons the best? Well, that's a really good question. I like that question because um, I get so fraught at some of these uh, TV shows of prisons and you know, there's one, there's one currently called Screw um, that um, I just can't watch. I think I watched five minutes of it. If, if somebody followed me around and made a program about my day as a governor at Wormwood Scrubs, they'd probably be bored to tears and falling asleep. I understand the artistic license. I understand there's got to be drama in it. Um, but some of it virgins on the, the absolute ridiculous. Um, but saying that, there was a, um, a film with Sean Bean um, about 12, 18 months ago called Time, which I thought was brilliant. Sean Bean played it brilliantly. The, you know, inside a jail for the first night, um, that, whole, that whole scene was, was brilliant. And I thought, thought that one was probably one of the best. Oh, has anyone escaped on your watch? I have had an escape. It was an armed escape um, from a hospital. Um, whilst I was governor at Wormwood Scrubs, um, the circumstances of the incident, you know, um, I'm not afraid to admit, it's something that haunted me for a long time. The prisoner concerned feigned in, um, illness um, we thought that he was faking. We had intelligence that he would fake an illness to get out of the jail. A doctor came along and quite correctly, you know, life should take precedent. 
um, said that he should go out to hospital. We contacted the local police and said that we had a prisoner who was uh, being sent out to hospital that we had grave concerns over. The police said they were far too busy to attend but would send a patrol car by. We phoned the director of the hospital security and asked them to put extra security guards um, at the ambulance entrance, uh, which they agreed to. I sent three staff um, and double cuffed the prisoner. So he was cuffed like that and then cuffed to an officer. About five, 10 minutes after the ambulance had left the gate, I got a phone call from the control room saying that the staff had just phoned the um, ambulance had been held up by armed gunmen. Um, and thankfully, the staff did absolutely the right thing. They gave the uh, gunman the keys of the handcuffs and uh, the prisoner made good his escape. It was an absolute carnage of a scene. At the three staff that um, I sent out to that hospital, one member of staff um, moved from being an officer to an admin grade. One member of staff was medically retired. Another member of staff was medically retired and later killed himself. So that is my uh, dealings with, uh, with an escape. And that is one of my biggest regrets of my life. He said, right, okay, you're gonna have to come upstairs with me. There's a Northwest area search team waiting for you. Mm. I was like, oh God, here we go. And I knew the game was up then. Mm. So I walked up the stairs, there was two dogs, a couple of handlers, three or four different officers. There was a governor there and I just thought, right, it's over.